you. My name is Omri Gazit. I am the co-founder and CEO of Acerto, which is an authorization company. But I'm also wearing another hat today. I am uh, the co-chair of the newest OpenID Foundation working group called AuthZen. And so I'm here to talk to you about the work that we're doing in AuthZen around standardizing authorization. Our goal is no less than becoming the OpenID Connect of authorization. Who knows what OpenID Connect is? Pretty much everyone. Excellent. A little bit about myself before we start. I've been doing software for developers for well over 30 years now. Um, I uh, helped start the .NET project at Microsoft. I was also one of the co-founders of Azure, uh, the general manager for what became Azure Active Directory. So I have a lot of roots in the identity and access space. About 12 years ago, I started working on open source, uh, including OpenStack and Cloud Foundry, later on Docker and Kubernetes, uh, most recently Puppet. Uh, I love startups. Asserto is my third startup, and when I'm not startuping, I'm skiing. Uh, although, as I mentioned yesterday in my talk, I'm really um, chafed at the fact that the slopes are opening a week from Friday, so I could not combine this with, with a ski trip. So who knows the difference between authentication and authorization? Everyone. All right, I won't belabor this. Authentication, did the user prove that they are who they say they are? Back when I started in this industry, it was user IDs and passwords. Now it's magic links and uh, pass keys and biometrics, but the process is all the same. Authorization, what can they do in the context of this application? Who knows some of these standards that I've uh, put up on here? SAML, 20 years old now. Um, uh, OAuth 2, 16 years old, OpenID Connect, as we said, 11 years old. These are mature standards in the space. And you have a set of mature developer services that implement these standards so that no one needs to go build login authentication on their own if they don't have to. Right? You have Auth0, and you have Cognito, and you have Azure Active Directory, Entra ID now, so on and so forth, uh, to help you with that, as opposed to doing some undifferentiated heavy lifting. So this is a solved problem. Authorization, not solved. Who can tell me, like, can anybody shout a name of an authorization standard that you know about? ZACMO. ZACMO. All right. Who else? Muma. Muma. Yes. Um, there are two. So uh, I think uh, there are about 200 people in the audience, 150. That's 2% of you that um, know about authorization standards. So not very well uh, known. Uh, certainly, they haven't quite you know, hit the same way that authentication standards have hit. And of course, this talk is about trying to go up that hill again. Um, developer service, what is the auth zero of authorization, anyone? It's like there are half a dozen startups like mine, Asura is one of them, that are trying to build authorization platforms, but no one has gotten to scale yet. Uh, and that's because we don't have a standard uh, to converge around uh, so that uh, relying parties in the OAuth uh, parlance or uh, PEPs in the auth authorization parlance can actually build against a single uh, spec or a single set of libraries. So we have not yet coalesced this, uh, this industry. And that leads everyone to have to roll out their own authorization, right? So no developer services, no spec, everybody does it differently. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, problems with that. The first one is security. I'll get back to that one in a moment. The second one is inconsistency. When you have an organization that has, that's drunk the microservices Kool-Aid, you have uh, dozens or hundreds of microservices, and every one of these does authorization differently, you have a bunch of inconsistency. It's very hard to tell who has access to what. And lastly, opportunity cost. Again, if you have to go build all this stuff on your own, uh, that's time that you're not spending making your software better for your customers. Back to security. Uh, if we look at the uh, organization that looks at security vulnerabilities for web applications, the OWASP, uh, in 2021, they uh, reissued their OWASP top 10. Uh, broken access control was number one on their top 10 list. And if you look at the OWASP API top 10, the number one, number three, and number five uh, vulnerabilities had to do with broken access control. So this is a really big problem. The OWASP rec uh, estimates that 94% of the applications that they test exhibit some form of broken access control. So that is the motivation uh, that we have with in, inside of OpenID. Uh, that was the motivation that we had to go start a new working group around this topic. It's not all bad news, though. 
Uh, I like to say that authorization is finally having its moment. Uh, and that's, as usual, led by the large tech vendors. So we had Google in 2020 that uh, wrote now a seminal paper called uh, the Zanzibar paper. I like to say that this is the MapReduce paper uh, for the authorization space. In it, they describe how they built a global, uh, very scalable system for authorization for all their Google, uh, uh, all their Google apps. So Google. Uh, cloud, calendar, docs, drive, and so on and so forth. They all use this system underneath the covers to manage permissions uh, and ask the, answer the question, does this user have this permission on this resource? Intuit, Airbnb, Netflix, Carta, Uber, Reddit, this slide you know, uh, would have gotten uh, too busy if I listed all the different papers. But now we finally have enough to, you know, en enough best practices to go on to start democratizing this uh, for everybody else. And so well, that's what we call cloud-native authorization. And I want to define it by comparing it with how we did authorization traditionally, uh, or old school or traditional authorization, along three axes, the what, the how, and the when. So what we authorize with traditional authorization is typically coarse-grained. It's at the level of a tenant. So I'm a viewer of a tenant. That means that I view access to all the things in the tenant. Uh, how we do that is, we write a bunch of if and switch statements. Uh, we like to call this uh, authorization spaghetti logic that checks whether an access token happens to have a scope or a claim in it that corresponds to some role that the user has in the application. And when we compute, uh, you know, this permission is usually during the authentication ceremony. The identity provider will figure out what additional scopes to stick in the access token, mint that access token, and call it a day. Now, of course, that's uh, not very fine grained, and I'll talk about why that is, you know, some of the issues uh, with that approach, but I'll contrast that with what I call cloud native authorization, which is fine grained, policy based, and real time. Fine grained meaning we are authorizing at the level of a resource. So, does this user have the read permission on this document as opposed to a whole tenant? Policy based, the idea of extracting authorization logic out of the application and storing and versioning that uh, in a, as a separate textual artifact in source control, being able to reason about that separately, that enables separation of duties. And then finally, real time. Rather than relying on scopes that are baked into access tokens, we make a real time call to an authorization system asking it, does this subject have this permission on this resource? And it gives us a real time answer. So let's take a, you know, a small example. Um, let's say that Google wanted to use the OAuth2 OpenID Connect uh, set of specifications, i.e. the authentication standards to try to implement authorization for Google Docs. I'm logging in into Google Drive, and now the part of the auth authentication ceremony tries to figure out what documents I have access to. Really? I mean, how many? Could be hundreds, could be thousands. Are you really gonna create scopes for each one of them? Stick it in an access token. Um, that would uh, blow the you know, HTTP header limits. But most damning is as soon as that access token is minted, it's already stale. Because whether that access token has like the typical lifetime of you know, 15 minutes or two hours or even one minute, I could have lost access to that document. And now I have access to a document that I don't, I don't have because OAuth2 and OpenID Connect give me a bearer token. And that bearer token and that pr practice of treating permissions, uh, you know, treating scopes and access tokens as permissions is really fundamentally flawed, right? So that's why we need cloud native authorization. That makes sense, everyone? Hang together? Excellent. All right. Um, let's dive into those uh, uh, three things, fine grained policy based and real time because we have 35 minutes. Uh, fine, fine grained, uh, you know, let me take you down a trip down memory lane. I started in this industry in the 80s. Uh, yes, I'm that old. I remember uh, Unix systems used to have nine bits for expressing the kinds of permissions that you could have on files. And files or inodes uh, in Unix parlance were the resource that you wanted to secure. Uh, you had read, write, and execute permissions across user, group, and other. And that was the extent of your permissioning system. Now, each file could have different permissions, and it was kind of very difficult to go administer, you know, if you wanted to model your resources as files, um, you know, you had a, 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 an explosion of ACLs 
uh, access control lists. And so we tried to create systems to help us wrangle some of that complexity. Next, next up was RBAC. So RBAC was the idea of assigning roles to users. Roles were typically business roles. They were modeled as groups inside of directories like LDAP or uh, Microsoft's Active Directory. And you could answer a question, does this user have access to this resource, by asking whether they were in a role which translated to looking up their group memberships. Now, that was a little better, but it ended up leading to what we call role explosion in the parlance. So when I left Microsoft in 2011, uh, we had 100,000 employees. Anybody want to venture a guess as to how many groups we had? Pretty close, 300,000. And in fact, uh, I think uh, my co-founder said, no, you're, you've underestimated. It was actually more like 500,000. So no one knew what these groups were for. No one knew who had access to what. Um, in order to you know, manage some of that group, group explosion, this new idea of fine-grained authorization started uh, taking hold uh, with a spec called Exactmo. You got it right, sir. <laughs> um, and that was uh, a sister spec to SAML. It came out around the same time, around 2003, uh, and it was much less adopted. It had a bunch of angle brackets in it, so sure SAML had angle brackets too, but you know, I like to say it was a spec that only a mother could love, uh, and I say that lovingly because my team helped, uh, helped, <laughs> helped write it. Uh, but the idea there was that you move to attribute-based access control. So you had attributes on users, attributes on resources. You had a policy to be able to intersect those things. And so that worked pretty well in situations where, say, you had a uh, top-secret clearance on a document. And you had top-secret clearance on a user. You could intersect those and say, okay, well, this user has access to this document. Uh, and you could introduce things like environmental attributes and, and, and others as well. Um, and the theory was that you could basically share these attributes across applications, and so you'd have a smaller set of attributes than you had roles. The practice was that every application defines its own attributes, and uh, at a conference uh, earlier this year at Identiver, somebody came up to me and said, hey, do you know how many attributes we have in our users? This was from uh, a, defense, uh, uh, a defense person, and I said, uh, thousands, and he said, try 40,000. So it didn't really actually solve the problem. And then lastly, uh, in 2020, Google repopularized a model called the Relationship-Based Access Control Model, REBAC for short. And uh, this, uh, the origins of this were in 2008, but uh, Google basically built their system, the Zanzibar system, around this relationship-based model. And the idea is that you model uh, permissions as a set of relationships between subject and object. And Figuring out whether a user has a permission on a document means traversing that graph of relationships. So for example, does Eve have read access on this document, on the, say, the engineering group document? Well, she's a member of the engineering group. The engineering group is a viewer on the engineering folder. The document is parented by that folder, and therefore, Eve have, has access. Anybody who's ever used Google Drive or Google Docs uh, you know, kind of like understands this model pretty intuitively. So it's a pretty attractive model because it matches up with intuitions of users. I'll get back to ABAC and REBAC in a second because those are the, uh, you know, two centers of gravity for cloud native authorization for that ecosystem. But first I want to briefly cover policy and real time. So policy-based access management, again, the reminder is the idea of lifting uh, policy or authorization logic out of the application and expressing it in its own domain-specific language and versioning it uh, as code. So here we have a policy in Rego, which is the surface syntax for the OPA project. Anybody know Rego? Fair number of people, excellent. This is Coupon, uh, and OPA is a graduated project, has been for a while. This policy is super simple. It basically says that you're allowed if the uh, department property of a, of the logged in user is uh, equal to operations. It also has a little Easter egg in here that shows how you can combine relationship-based access management uh, in, in, a, in a system called Topaz. Um, but most importantly, the idea is that you no longer have to write switch statements or if statements inside your logic and figure out whether you know, a 
access token has a certain scope. Instead, you encapsulate a call to an externalized authorization system using middleware. So this is a Node.js or Express.js route handler. It has a piece of middleware called checkout Z. It makes a call out to an externalized authorization system, and it gets back an answer. And then uh, if it's true, then you know, if the user has access, then it dispatches uh, the rest of the call. And this gives you a lot of benefits. You can store inversion policy just like application code. Every policy change is part of a git change log, so you have audit trails for policy changes. Uh, you can reason about them centrally by a security team that specializes in authorization policies. And lastly, you can build them into immutable images using a little tool here uh, called uh, Open Policy Containers, or uh, OPCR for short, the policy CLI, that allows you to practice a secure software supply chain on your policies, just like your container images. And then lastly, uh, I want to talk about the real-time aspect. So uh, fine-grained policy-based real-time. Real-time, um, you know, I would say induces the idea that authorization is actually a distributed systems problem, and that's why it's actually hard to get right. So you want to authorize locally. Why? Unlike login, which is a one-and-done thing, you amortize the cost of login across an entire session. So it can take you 500 milliseconds. You can talk to a service that's the internet away, like Auth0 or Okta. Authorization is in the critical path of every application request, right? So you can't go across the internet to talk to some hosted service. Typically, your latency budget is way too small for that. Um, and so you have to have the authorizer sitting close to your application. That typically means that it's either a sidecar if you're running a Kubernetes pod, or it's another microservice in the same Kubernetes cluster. Um, you also want all the data that's used for authorization to be stored locally, uh, and so you compute decisions over local data. At the same time, you need a central management plane to manage uh, you know, all the data and all the policies uh, that lead to, you know, that are, contribute to a, a, a decision. So identity data, typically identity providers are the source of truth for users and groups and group memberships. You want to be able to distribute those to all the edge authorizers, uh, you know, and have a, a central place where you make all these changes and, and then uh, distribute them out to, in, in near real time. Uh, you also want the same thing to happen with policies. Policies, as I said, are stored and versioned in Git. Uh, you want to be able to build them into immutable images and then distribute them out to the edge authorizers. And lastly, uh, this presentation won't touch too much on decision logs, but I can't underestimate the importance of being able to capture fine-grained decision logs. Every decision that uh, the application made should be centralized in your SIEM systems for compliance and for forensics. So that's why um, Real-time is such an important attribute or principle of uh, cloud-native authorization. So let's talk about the two ecosystems now in the cloud-native world. We have the policy as code camp, which uh, is closer to the ABAC model, and the policy as data camp, uh, the REBAC model. Uh, the first one is largely stateless, and the second one is stateful. And so we have a set of specifications that emerged uh, on both sides of the house. So ExactMol, as again, as we said, uh, you know, was uh, solidified around, you know, the early 2000s. Alpha is the, you know, kind of the successor to that. Uh, those are real specifications, uh, you know, Oasis specs. On the other side, we have NIST with NGAC, which uh, was the first time that we saw standard around graph-based, relationship-based access control. And Zanzibar is not really a spec, but it in in inspired a lot of innovation in the space, why so I put it here. AuthZen is the first effort to try to consolidate all these things. So it is the spec that tries to be, you know, a big tent and cater to both the policy as code and policy as data camps. In terms of the open source uh, ecosystem out here, we have a number of different open source projects. Open Policy Agent is the most well-known of the, these. Casbin uh, is a Golang project that is about 10 years old. It has the most stars, uh, a few others. Uh, Steeder is uh, something that came out of AWS in the last year and a half. Um, all of these are largely stateless models. Uh, and then on the right, we have Zanzibar-inspired uh, projects. Now, Google didn't open source anything with Zanzibar, right? It didn't even write a spec, it wrote a technical report. So a lot of these implementations, OpenFGA, for example, is a CNCF sandbox project, they all have their own schema languages, own data languages, so there's not really a standard for how to build a Zanzibar-based system. Topaz, uh, in full disclosure, that's the project that 
uh, my company uh, works on is, is the first to try to unify these camps as well. It uses OPA as its engine, and uh, it has a Zanzibar directory. But the point is that um, none of these specs have actually done any good for the open source implementations. None of the ones on the bottom left actually adhere to any of the specs on top. And one of the, you know, there's no spec for the ones on the right to adhere to as well. Again, AuthZen is really the only game in town, the only spec, the only uh, standards process that tries to unify these, uh, all these different, um, you know, places of innovation. So let's dive into AuthZen. Uh, first, uh, describing a little bit about our charter. Um, by the way, this deck, I think, is up on uh, the, the site here, so you can follow along. Uh, there's links uh, to you know, all the different artifacts that I'm talking about here. The AuthZen Charter um, is really built around this, uh, what we call the P-Star-P architecture. So who remembers the uh, ISO OSI network model? Anybody? A few of you, right? So what people uh, typically don't remember is that there was actually a software stack uh, that was the OSI uh, networking stack. All we remember these days is layer three, network layer, layer four, transport layer, level seven, uh, application layer. It gives us a reference architecture, a set of terms to describe different parts of the, that layer cake. That's all that's left from Xaml, honestly. Xaml defined all these terms uh, and architecture for how uh, authorization actually happens. And so we have that uh, exact multi thank for that. Um, and so there are really four terms that are important to remember here. The policy enforcement point, uh, this is the thing that's asking uh, for an authorization decision, typically an application. In OAuth terms, it's called a relying party. The policy decision point, the PDP, is the thing that makes the decision based on a set of data that it has and a policy. The policy information point contributes data to uh, that decision-making process, and the policy administration point is the thing that manages policies and helps deliver those to the PDP. I call this the tetrahedron. Uh, we're working on the top leg of that tetrahedron right now is the first thing that we're standardizing, the PEP to PDP API. Uh, why? Because it's the lowest uh, hanging fruit here. None of the authorization vendors feels like there's some weird IP, you know, like or competitive advantage that we get from uh, the protocol for talking to our PDP. It's all the same. They all look mostly the same. We can standardize them. Later on, we plan on doing some things that are a little bit harder, like uh, standardizing how events flow from PIPs to PDPs and also how to manage policies. Uh, but, you know, the initial focus uh, over the last year has been on the PEP to PDP API. Let's see. We have um, about 17 minutes left. All right, we're doing good. Um, so the first implementer's draft uh, that we have published uh, will actually get uh, ratified tomorrow. The OpenID Foundation has uh, the voting period over the last two weeks has gotten us over the threshold. So I guess a round of applause is kind of like due here. We have the first, um, you know, a day away from having the first formal implementers draft. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. It's time to go implement support for AuthZen. And what you'll notice here is the draft is just super simple. It's just like falling off a log simple to go implement one of these things here. Let me uh, show what the spec looks like here. Let me make this a little bigger. Um, this is what the information model looks like for an AuthZen call. Um, let's see. Let me find, uh, here we go. So we basically have uh, in a payload, in an uh, incoming payload, we have a subject, a resource, an action, and a context. The subject has type and ID as mandatory attributes and a set of uh, optional properties. Resource, same exact thing. Action has a single mandatory name and again, a set of optional properties. And then context is optional and has key value pairs or you know, other JSON objects. So super simple um, you know, structure here, very easy to write a JSON schema for. We have a protobuf for it, so it's very easy to go target this particular spec and go build uh, language bindings for it. And then the response is also super simple. The simplest response is a decision with a Boolean value, and you can optionally have some more context that gives you reasons, for example, as to why that decision was made. So again, very, very simple, and pretty much all of the implementations um, 
out there kind of look more or less like this. Now, not surprisingly, or the, for the discerning audience member, you'll see that we have made mandatory the five tuple for reback systems. So we try to be opinionated uh, and say, okay, so the mandatory fields are subject type, subject ID, object type, object ID, and um, relation or permission in the reback parlance. But on top of that, you can add optional properties that will look like contextual tuples in a reback system. Sorry if that went over, uh, over some people's heads. Happy to answer questions on that. Um, the first um, interop to do, uh, sorry, interop use case is a to-do application. To-do applications are toys, everybody knows that, but they're also very familiar. So we decided to start there. And so we defined a scenario here. Um, there's an interop website, uh, authzeninterop.net. Uh, there's a QR code that I'll put up in a second as well. And it defines basically all the payloads and you know, what is expected to come back from uh, the authorizer, from the PDP. Um, and so it has the protagonist is uh, uh, a subject that may have a set of roles uh, and uh, they're trying to operate on to-dos and they have a set of operations that they're trying to, uh, you know, uh, you know, they're trying to view or create to-dos or complete to-dos or uncomplete them or delete those. Um, so that is the scenario that we have. Um, the architecture for the interop scenario is, again, super simple. We have a React front end that talks to a Node.js backend, uh, and those, that backend can be configured to talk to one of all of the authorizers that com uh, comply with the spec. Um, so here's a, an example of what that looks like. Um, it happens to use Topaz, uh, which is uh, my favorite authorizer. And it has, uh, you know, it has a, a way to formulate some requests here. So for example, I can be Rick. Rick happens to be an evil genius. Uh, anybody know the Rick and Morty cartoon? Okay, enough of you. For, for those of you who don't, uh, Rick is an evil genius. Morty is his uh, uh, grandson's sidekick. Uh, and Rick can do everything, obviously. So for example, uh, Rick can delete Morty's to-dos. Uh, but Morty can't delete uh, Rick's to do. So if I execute that, this is what the AuthZen uh, payload looks like. I can copy that as a curl. Um, I can paste that into a uh, terminal here. Um, life is good, right? So this is a very simple way of using AuthZen. Um, great. Uh, so let's actually, actually before that, I'll show a, a, more, a, pr a more proper demo. Let me show you the, what the to-do app actually looks like. I'm gonna log in here as Morty. As I said before, Morty can create his own to-dos. Uh, Morty can um, complete his own to-dos, delete his own to-dos, uh, but can't touch Rick's to-dos. I'm going to uh, use the 1.1 one, one preview uh, version, so I can pick the AuthZen version. Uh, we have a 1.0 implementers draft. 1.1 one, one adds box card. Uh, you know, execution, so you can get answers to more than one query at a time. And as you can see here, Morty has, uh, you know, doesn't, can't even click on completing to-dos that he doesn't have access to. Um, he can try to delete Rick's to-dos, he can't do that either. He can create his new to-do, hi KubeCon. Um, and he can complete his own to-do. And here I'm using the Asserto, um, you know, the Asserto authorizer for this. I'm gonna use the Cerbos authorizer to um, uncomplete this. Um, so it works exactly the same way. And if I log out and log back in as Rick, oops, Rick uh, is again the evil genius. He can do everything. He can delete Morty's to do uh, using the Cerbos uh, um, uh, PDP or any of the other ones uh, that are available here. So uh, there are 11 on that particular list. Great, so that's, uh, you know, because uh, interop demos are like watching the paint dry on the walls, we decided to go actually put a front end in front of this. Um, we also have, uh, this is the AuthZen repo. You can get clone that thing. Uh, so if you go to GitHub, OpenID AuthZen, let me crank the font up on this. Um, this is just all open source. Uh, this entire thing is sitting there. Um, there's a interop folder with an authzen to do backend um, directory here. You can look at the PDPs that are supported. These are all the different versions of the, can people see this? Crank up the font, yes, no? Yeah, can people see this, excellent. Um, so 
for example, I can go pick, uh, you know, the, let's say the, I'll, I'll pick Cerebos because uh, they helped uh, build some of this demo. Uh, I can actually go do a yarn test, uh, which is uh, running the test suite against this thing. And this is actually watching the paint dry. Uh, so we have a conformance suite for this particular scenario that runs across all of these things and gets back an answer. Some of the funner things to do, for example, are um, to actually, let's run this with uh, the, let me see, um, I forget what the, the parameters for this is. Yarn test, let's give it the same, uh, we'll give it a spec version of 1.1 preview. And we'll run against the same authorizer. And the whole idea is that you can execute this against any of the PDPs and they give you the same, the same answer. So uh, at the risk of belaboring the point, I can go back to Postman. I can go paste this thing into a new window. Uh, I actually have some uh, here already. So this is the evaluations call. I'm quite sure that people can't see the font on this, unfortunately. Let's see if I can make this a little smaller. The evaluations call uh, takes actually uh, an evaluations array that gives you the ability to execute multiple uh, calls here. And I can go send that to a one one compatible PDP and it can actually give me uh, you know, uh, a couple of answers here. So all of this works uh, equally well across all the different PDPs. Great, so these are the interoperable implementations so far. We have 11 that uh, speak the 1.1 preview uh, protocol. Uh, we have three more that are in the process of updating to the 1.0 implementers draft, as well as uh, the 1.1 preview. We have a couple of other names. Uh, I won't name the vendors here, but large vendors that uh, are now starting to go build support for this as well. Uh, they have uh, po you know, fairly popular open source projects. Uh, I won't steal their thunder, but uh, we believe that we are like basically at the tipping point where this will become a fairly standard way to go talk to PDPs. So very exciting. Less than one year, uh, about one year into this effort, uh, we've been able to make a lot of progress. Um, I do want to add, you know, kind of like tee up the question of, so, okay, what is this good for? Um, you know, what are the enforcement points that I want to use uh, AuthZen for? The first one, I did poo-poo the idea of using uh, the authentication ceremony as a way to create, you know, kind of permissions by storing them as scopes and access tokens, but people do this. Your identity, identity provider can go to an AuthZen PDP and get a set of scopes and put them in an access token. That's, uh, you know, I would say the coarse grained uh, authorization, you know, uh, in a defense in depth kind of strategy. The second one is uh, at the API gateway. You can uh, basically, you know, do AuthZen based uh, API authorization by checking whether the user represented by the JWT has, uh, you know, a permission, an invoke permission on a particular API. And then lastly, uh, in the API code, if that check succeeds, in the API code, you can actually uh, put middleware there to abstract uh, the process of calling an AuthZen-based PDP and getting back an answer. So three different places uh, to use AuthZen uh, in a defense in depth architecture. What's next? We have a resource, uh, a search API. Um, let me kind of demonstrate what, you know, kind of why this is interesting. I'm gonna bring up a console here uh, for Topaz, which is my favorite authorizer. Um, it has, uh, you know, this is kind of like modeling to-dos as a set, a set of resources, but you can ask all sorts of questions. Like for example, find all the users that have access. Let's uh, actually use uh, the resource here. Um, find all the users that have access to the gather mega seeds, can delete the gather mega seeds uh, to-do. Turns out that only Rick can. Um, so, you know, and vice versa, we can look at all the, uh, all the to-dos that um, a particular user can delete. So let's look at, for Morty's users, uh, Morty's uh, to-dos, and he has three of them, right? So you can actually now ask what-if scenarios. This is an adjacent scenario to the check scenario, but is super useful for, you know, like finding out, like for example, putting a, in a UI a set of to-dos that a user actually has access to. Um, and vice versa, being able to say, okay, for this document, who are the people who can actually read it or write it, and so on and so forth. So it's a sister scenario, it's an adjacent scenario, but also very important. We also wanna work with relying parties, uh, you know, large companies like Salesforce, are you in the house? 
Workday, ServiceNow, and even smaller, you know, kind of SaaS vendors to help you externalize your authorization. We think that this is kind of just like you're externalizing your authentication today so that people can plug in their own SSO system. You should externalize authorization so that large enterprises can be able to, you know, kind of in interject some of their authorization policy inside of that, you know, that ceremony. Um, want to create more interop scenarios, want to get a few more reback vendors uh, onboarded here and uh, pursue the other legs of that tetrahedron. This is where to find us. Um, you know, we have uh, OpenID Foundation is an open organization. Uh, you can join the calls anytime. There's a QR code that takes you to the uh, OpenID found, uh, AuthZen Working Group page. And uh, we welcome you to join us. If you want to contribute to the spec, you do have to sign an IPR agreement, uh, as do most standards or all standards bodies, uh, so that they can identify any adopters from any IP infringement claims. Uh, but that's more or less, uh, you know, the, the, the bar is low uh, to be able to contribute. Now, I think I'm uh, over time, so I will skip this particular slide. I was going to give you a bonus slide of if you want to go, if you're in the, in the crowd and you're trying to build an authorization system for your uh, organization. These are, I would say, the principles that we would uh, advocate for you to pursue. Fine-grained policy, policy-based, real-time, central management, compliance and forensics. But importantly, you want to make it cloud-native and open. So if you build one of these, uh, you want to make it not just based on um, you know, CNCF technologies, but also on AuthZen uh, to maximize the ecosystem effects that you're going to get from that. So that's all I had for prepared remarks. Uh, if you want to come find me during uh, the conference, I have uh, a QR code here, uh, easy to schedule some time with me. I'm also going to be at the Project Pavilion tomorrow uh, between 1.30 and 5 p.m. Uh, at the OPCR project uh, kiosk. So I can answer questions about OPCR as well as general questions about AuthZen or authorization. Uh, I'm also getting together with some of my friends and competitors uh, uh, at, on Friday at 2 p.m. for a Policy Engines showdown. Uh, if you want to get one of these shirts, I have a few left, uh, as well as stickers, so come find me at the OPCR booth tomorrow. With that said, I don't know if you, we have time for questions.